Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Midweek Bible Study at the Center Ridge Bible Church in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's uh, great to have you here tonight as we go through this uh, special study. And um, let's just begin by saying hi to those who are here in person and um, those who are online, YouTube and Facebook. We're hot here tonight because the AC was over. We had problems with the power, so if you see me sweating, that's why, and we're trying to get that working. Uh, but uh, we're going to open up in Revelation 13, 9. Real short, brief scripture. If any man have an ear to hear, let him hear. And in other portions of scriptures, it says, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight, Lord. Uh, we pray, Father, for this word as it goes forth. Uh, seems like there's been, and this just really clinches it, uh, many forces at play to, to really not have this happen. And uh, it's kind of interesting, all the things that transpired uh, today. But as always, Father, we pray, Father, you give the winds a mighty voice. You take this message to the four corners of the galaxies and beyond. And if not there, take it to those who are listening online. If, it, if not there, take it to those who are here. And if not there, uh, speak to my heart, Lord. We pray for those who are listening, and we thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so this is our study, Center Ridge Bible Church, part three, Why Some Call God Monster. And uh, like I said in the prayer, wow, there's been things happening since last week, especially in regards to this study. Uh, number one, so many scriptures. Oh, gosh, we've had so many. I've just been researching and studying and studying. There's so many scriptures about this that my head is spinning because I don't know which ones to use. I keep on collecting them. That would be a great one. This is an answer to one of the questions. So that's a great thing. But on the flip side, I want to share with you, uh, it's interesting. This study has been very uncomfortable for me uh, since we began it because it's an uncomfortable thing to teach. And I've been praying like, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this or maybe we'll just go through it quickly and get out of it and just put it to rest quickly. Because I tell you, there's been so many forces at work to not let it happen. Uh, to not do it, to let it go, to drop it. Um, and I began praying, like I said, to maybe let it wind down. And then today, talk about the providence of God. I tell you, I, this is, you can't make this stuff up. The providence of God. Because just today, this morning, just this morning on my daily news feed, the smoking gun from God came through on why this study must go on, okay? And I don't care how long it takes. I don't care if it takes six months. We're going to go through this because it can't be rushed through. Because there are so many things that need to be spoken of, especially when we're talking about the character of God. Because the world is calling God monster. And we know in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. And that's an issue. And what did I see in my news feed? Because I'm always connected to all these rock bands and stuff and famous heavy metal things. There was an article about Ozzy Osbourne, if you guys know who he is, okay, from Black Sabbath. I was actually was a big, big fan back in the day. And uh, does anybody know what he's called in the rock and roll world? The Prince of Darkness. The Prince of Darkness. And this, new feed, this news feed comes up about his new album. Remember, he's really been sick. He was in a hospital, a lot of things going on. And this news feed comes up about his new album. He's putting out a new album. And he has all these famous guitar players playing on him, uh, uh, with him on this album he's putting out. It'll probably be his last album. He's very old and he can barely walk around. But I saw this. Eric Clapton, who's playing guitar on one of the songs, if you know who Eric Clapton is, he's a famous guitarist even before Ozzy's day. And he was playing guitar, I believe, on this one song, and one of the words of the song 
It goes this. This is the words that Ozzy wrote. One of those days when I don't believe in Jesus Christ. Eric Clapton was so upset that he told him, don't put those words in your song. And that was the article. Eric Clapton complains to Ozzy, don't use those words. And I say, wow, I got to read this article. This is really interesting. So Eric Clapton tells Ozzy about this, and Ozzy says, I'm not removing it. And this was his reason. Losing faith in Jesus Christ makes sense when the world is turning to SH, you know what it is. Okay? So, what does that mean? What's he saying? Just what I'm talking about. Who's getting the blame for the crumbling world? God is, and Jesus Christ, by who? Atheists, agnostics, and those who think Satan is cool. Satan never gets blamed for anything. Well, of course, the prince of darkness is not going to blame himself, right? Obviously, he's not Satan. But Satan is always cool, and Christ is weak, and a fool, and a joke. And I was thinking... Thank you, Lord, because that's what we're talking about. Right there. God is getting blamed for everything that's going wrong. And the problem is, who is defending God? Now, I know God doesn't need our defense. But if there is someone that you love that's important to you, you're going you're gonna to stand up and you're going to speak up, and you should. So that really spoke to my heart that we're going to finish this study. And we'll end it when God said, God says enough has been said. Because I tell you, and now this morning, and I shared this about that we have no AC right now, and it's trying to come on. I was working on the study, going over my notes and stuff, and I put my computer on, and then right then the power goes out. And I hear a big pop, and my computer is like, and I go, oh, Lord. I said, my computer, I said, this is a big problem, and I couldn't get it back on again. Now, I have a computer, it's like 25 years old, it's not online, it's this old computer, but it's my old friend. My life is on that computer. Wow. All my research of everything I've ever studied, it, it's all backed up, but this study hasn't, I, I backed it up now. But this study, all my research, I've been spending weeks just finding scriptures about this. They were just amazing scriptures. And then all of a sudden, the computer was dead. Everything was dead. It wouldn't come on. All the power was on with my computer. I actually got cold sweats. You know, you get into a panic. I'm on my knees going, oh, gosh, please, Lord, let my computer come back. And thank God it came back on. And it was a miracle. So... I truly believe we need to hold on because you need to know this, okay? The world needs to know this. And that's my introduction. But getting back to the reason why I'm doing this study, and I know I'm repeating myself. I'm trying to chop off the beginning a little bit more each week. But for those people who just pop in or jump in online, I don't want them to miss the basic idea. And make sure you do go to our... YouTube page, Center Beach Bible Church, uh, make sure you hit subscribe, or you don't have to, but listen to part one, part two, and this is part three. And I don't know how many parts they're gonna, there's gonna be 20 parts, there'll be 20 parts, but we're not gonna finish until everything that needs to be said is said. And I completely, now I have no more reservation about it because uh, it is obviously clear this needs to be said. But anyway, the reason that this really triggered me to do this study a few months back was two things. Number one, I posted a clip on social media about another city that's in collapse and turmoil. Just, I mean, you know what's going on in these cities, it's horrible. It's just, you know, heroin addicts and crime and people are moving out. And I posted a little thing and I said, this is what happens when God is kicked out of our society. And then someone commented, you know, well, why would God allow this? You see, why you, you know, why didn't God come and fix it then? So that annoyed me, 
And it shouldn't, because I know that's what people think. Whenever there's something wrong, and we're going to be talking about this, you know, I remember back when the Twin Towers were hit, you know what? One of the first things that came, that people started saying, why would God allow that? Why didn't God stop the planes from hitting? There's an answer, and it's going to be in this study, and we're going to get to that. Because people, if you're defending Jesus Christ, and you don't know an answer to that, it's not good, because the Bible says, be ready always to give an answer for the hope that is in you. You need to be able to go, you know, I don't know. No, you need to be able to explain why these things are happening and why God would allow this. So that was number one. Number two, uh, when I did the study on atheism, evolution, UFOs, and false religions, uh, I did a lot of study of famous quotes from the, the unbelieving side, the atheists and the agnostics. And in that research, uh, I saw a quote of quotes that I read to you, and I'm going to read it again tonight. And between the people blaming God for all that's going on and the quotes of these atheists, it started to really bother me. And, and I started to realize, you know what? Most people do feel this way. They really do. But before we get to that quote, and I'm going to read it each week, I bring this study to you for another reason, which is what? Which is, what is the character of God? I tell you people, in these days that we live, if you don't know the character of God, that's a problem. Because God is either good and righteous and is going to be there for you and I, or he's not. And if we're not sure, I mean, when you meet someone, what do you want to know? What happens today if you go for a job interview? What do they do? How do they check you out? Background, background, check. background, checks. background checks. Background, background checks. checks. And you know what they check? What you put on social media now. They want to see what you're posting on social media. But they want to do a background check. Because you don't want, like if you're going to hire someone, like we we're going to... That I have someone to take care of, my wife's mom and stuff like that. You know, you do background checks for these people that you're going to let into your house. So, I mean, and no one complains about that. Well, we should be able to do a background check on God, okay? And, and it should come up perfection. Because if, if you're not sure about God, then you're not going to trust Him. And too many people are not sure because they're speaking so much about I want a good life and I want to be happy who you know they have focusing so much on what God can do for them they're forgetting who God is and what he is really about so the character of God it really needs to be defined and that's what we're going to do also in this study can we know yes we can know the character of a God and is there one defining trait one defining trait of God that, if we understand it, will explain the true character of God. And we're going to get to that one defining trait in the weeks to come. Okay? I've been giving you little clues about it each week, but there is one, and it's not what you might think. Okay? And we're going to get to that because the question is, Every day, why is God allowing so much evil and he seemingly does nothing about it? But anyway, here's the quote from the head atheist, the atheist of atheists, Mr. Richard Dawkins. Uh, he said, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. By the way, you know what? He, he gets the part that God is jealous because the Bible says that God is a jealous God. I'm going to do a whole night on that. Okay, not tonight. Because people have, they, they look at words that they don't understand. Okay, and they, for someone who's supposed to be so brilliant and so learned, and has so much education, you would think if you're doing an investigation, because in his book, The God Delusion, or Illusion, whatever they call it, 
you know, if you're gonna write stuff down, I know people check me out. Hey, you know, Pastor, you quoted the wrong scripture. Okay, tell me where I'm wrong. I apologize. I make a correction the week next, the the next week. If I quoted something or I said something wrong, someone calls me on it. I double check, make sure. And we're gonna, so we're gonna talk about that. But anyway, his quote says, "God is jealous. He's proud of it." Petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynist, homophobic, racist, infantile, genocidal, filicidal, pestilocidal, megalomaniac, sadomasochist, capriciously malevolent bully. Wow, that's a lot to call God. That's a lot to call God. And that brings us back to the character of God. Who is he? What is he like? And what does he want? Because if you don't understand that, people, and I know I'm repeating myself, but we need to keep hearing it. If we don't understand that, then everything is wrong. And we might even begin to believe that God is a monster. But is he? Another parallel I'm going to tie in, and it's going to be laced through this whole study, uh, which is uh, that many of a certain theological persuasion I find are not far from the monster God conclusion from that renowned atheist, and they don't even know it. Because their very theology in many Christian churches tries to explain away the seemingly monster side of God by their theology. Which means their very theology, by their very theology, God actually must be a monster to work. Okay, We're going to touch on that towards the end of the study in a couple of weeks where I'm going with that part. So there's a lot, there's so many things that need to be said, and I really wanted to wrap this up quick and move on to something happier, but we can't. It just can't be. It, it, we've got to go through this. But anyway, let's go back to where we left off last week and start answering some of these accusations against God so we can get to the character and know, is God monster or amazing? Okay, What is he? What is he? And remember this, people, also. If God is monster, then, you know, you have no hope. And everything that you're hoping to maybe turn around in your life or in this world is just a dream. Because there is no evil and it is no good. And whoever has the most money wins at the end of the day. Right? And we're all, it's all just a throw of the cards. And then there is no hope if that be so. And everything is this random. But let's get back to our accusation list against God. And I, last week, I left you on a big cliffhanger. Okay, I had people emailing me. Bears, you left me on a cliffhanger. What happens next? So, well, you got to stick around. Because I'm going to leave, leave you on a cliffhanger tonight, too. So that's one way we get you to keep on listening. But this was the accusation list. And we're going to take a big chunk out of it tonight. Why does God allow evil and suffering and pain? question of the ages, right? Why doesn't God just stop all this? Why did God create Satan if he knew what he would do? Why did he create man if he knew that man was going to fall? Why did he, and I always love these questions of, you know, Hitler versus Mother Teresa. You know, the two extremes of the, not the best person in the world and the worst person in the world. And people always ask, well, why did God let Hitler be born if he knew that he would kill 6, 000, 6 million Jews, God's chosen people, the Jews? Why doesn't God answer all my prayers and just make me happy? Why doesn't God just show himself as if he is real? Just come down into humanity, show yourself, and people you know, do some miracles, and people will know that you're real. Why does it seem that God actually told his people to kill in the Old Testament? And that's true, okay? Why does God just sit by and allow children to die of cancer? Big question. Those, you know, we all know those pains. Why doesn't God just stop all the lying and evil? 
Why does God allow lying, cheating, money grabbing hypocrite, pastors, clergy, and anyone in the religious world to be successful and become, you know, mega churches and all this stuff based on lies and frauds and getting people's money, you know? Why doesn't God stop? You know a lot of these people are frauds. Why doesn't he stop them? Why doesn't God just allow us to do what makes us happy if our happiness is the most important thing? Those are important questions. So if you answer these questions, it changes everything. Why are so many horrible th things done in the name of religion and God? And that's true, okay? Horrible things have been done in the name of religion, many religions. I agree with that, okay? But we need to answer that. Why are there pedophiles in the churches in certain denominations for years, covered up and hidden and all that kind of stuff? And this was the question, why does God say he is a jealous God? Isn't that a sin to be jealous? If we're jealous, that's the covet, that's a sin. Is God sinning? Why did God tell his ancient people, I have to change that, because, uh, oh, to kill, that's right. If that's one of the commandments, thou shalt not kill. If God told them to kill, take your soldiers, the nation of Israel, and go and, you know, and destroy these people and those people. Go with your armies and fight these battles. Isn't God going against his own command? Why doesn't God remove all the evil politicians <laughs> and raise up godly ones? If God is all love and accepts everyone, why does he hate us? to be what we want to be and allow us to be who we feel we were made to be, like homosexual, homosexual love and choosing your own gender and all that stuff. Why not? It's our bodies. Let us decide. God should want us to be happy. I just saw in the news today, somebody sent me a link. And you know, you know how all those things, they add into the flag, all these different the letters. The newest thing, people, and I told you this was coming, and you know it's coming, and that group, Two things. Number one is last week we spoke about the group that wants, uh, they have attraction to children, okay? They want to be, that's who they are. They want to be added to the PDFG, whatever the heck it is. But the newest one I saw today was sex with animals, okay? Bestiality. Bestiality. And whenever I would teach on that in the Old Testament, God said, don't have sex with animals. Like, who would do? God knows these things, people. They're doing it. They want to be identified as a new type of relationship. And they want to be all tagged together. It's not a joke. Look it up. I'm not making it up. Why doesn't God stop that? Why doesn't God bless America when we ask him over and over again? God, how many politicians? God bless America. Why doesn't he answer the prayers? Well, tonight we're going to tackle the first five here, okay? Why has, well, we're going to attempt to, we're going to just put our foot in the, in the water because I can just end this and just give you the character trait that God is that defines all these things, but... I really want to just spoon feed it to you so you really let it slowly, like a stew, get into your head. So tonight, why does he allow evil, suffering, and pain? Why doesn't God stop all of this? And we're going to focus on Satan tonight. Why create Satan if you knew what he would do? Because this really begins to answer all the questions after. Because what was, what was created first? Humans or the angels. or the angelic race, the angels were created. For, some people believe they were even created before the creation. So they are, you know, something that God made. And why even create man if you knew that he would fall? And again, Hitler. And, and all of this dovetails together. Why, you know, why allow Hitler to be born if you knew what he was going to do. And this brings up the important question that I did last week. We're not going to go into such a extent as I did, but just so you know where we left off last week, is man a machine like a car that is only, to, that is only designed to do 
what his maker designed it for. Okay, if you're a sewing machine, what does a sewing machine do? Sews, because that's what it was designed to do. It has no choice of its own. But the question is, is man more than that? Are we an autonomous being, creation? Okay, that's, that's an important question. And I gave you this crazy example last week about an old movie called Christine. It was about a car that was possessed. And it was, I think it's a Stephen King? Stephen King movie? Stephen King movie? Yes. Don't watch it, please. Harrison Scott was talking about it. <laughs> I'm not telling you to watch it. I did watch it back in the day. Uh, Christine was a possessed car that went around killing people. Well, what made the car do the killing? Who's to blame? And what made that particular car, even though it's fictional, what made it not like your car? Well, that car, Christine, was a driven agent. It was driven by something, but it wasn't controlled by a driver, but by its own desire. Be it outer programmed from an outer source, because you never known the movie. Do you ever find out it was it possessed by a dead spirit or something? I don't know. I don't know what the story was. But be it be it be it programmed by an outer force or an inner force, it doesn't really matter because it's all make believe. But being possessed by things isn't really make believe. But I don't know about a car being possessed. But some of the stories you guys tell me about your cars, I I wonder. Uh, so we, we began to take a deeper look into Christine the car as it went around killing people. And we thought, well, who should get blamed for the killing as there was no driver? Now, I know when you start to go down this road, I know there is going to be some out there who are saying, oh, I know where you're going with this pastor. That God isn't to blame for anything we are because we have freedom. We then, and if we have freedom, there are some that will complain that, well, if we have freedom, then we take control away from God, and then God is not in control. We are. But is that true? And that really opens up a debate of the ages within the Christian world, okay? Not in the secular world, but the Christian world, okay? Who is really in control? And I, and I guess to some degree, maybe even the secular spiritual world, if I can say that, because who is really in control of everything? Sovereign God or sovereign man? Or maybe something else? And does one negate the other? And, and we looked up the word sovereign because everybody likes the, oh, sovereign, God is sovereign. And well, you really got to know what that word means. And we looked it up, and, and we're going to talk about it more in the weeks to come. It was, it's going to come into play. Uh, the word sovereign, it means above or superior to all others, chief, greatest, supreme, supreme in power, rank, or authority, or holding the position of a ruler, royal, or reigning, okay, independent of all others. So it's an important word, and that definition we're going to go back to in the weeks to come because it's important, okay? But let's get back to our scenario, okay? Uh, because, you know what, to our surprise, there be many believers like the atheists out there that do believe that if man is not responsible for anything he does, then, like that atheist said, then God is a monster, okay? Because God is orchestrating. Which, if we take that to its fullest degree, let's just say that God is in control of everything and he makes everything happen. Well, what's the next logical step? What would be the conclusion? Well, why create Satan? Why create man? Why create Hitler? Well, you would have to conclude then that God then created Satan to fall. He made Satan fall. He caused Satan to choose evil, which means you would have to then add, as to mankind, God created man to sin, 
then tempted him with sin and made him sin. Boy, that would be like a monster. It really would. Which would mean that God made Hitler on purpose, making Hitler evil, causing Hitler to kill of no choice of his own, six million Jews. Meaning this God, this good, pure God actually causes sin? You see, that's, that's the dilemma here. <laughs> So that's where I left you guys off, and we just stopped like that. So we're going to answer some of these questions tonight, and we're going to go to the scriptures. And you're going, Phew. the lady's getting to those scriptures. Because without the scriptures, we don't really have anything but my opinion, okay? We've got to have the scriptures. So we're going to talk about Satan first, okay? And I'm going to surprise you and trick you on something here. Of Satan... Did God create him as he is, destined to do evil, planned to do evil, planned to rebel and to fall? Meaning that God wanted Satan to do evil, which then, again, if that's true, then God would have to be, one, not really that good, number two, not really that perfect, and number three, a monster. And so, we're going to begin to answer this question, and I'm going to say it. Did God create Satan? And the answer is no. Okay? Wait a minute, Pastor. Come on now. I'm telling you. Well, let's let the scriptures tell you. Do you know who God created? Lucifer. 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 The anointed angel Lucifer, meaning God created Lucifer. Do you know when Lucifer was created? He was perfect, he was holy, and he was just. Nothing wrong with him. And we better know that. And where are the scriptures? Well, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Okay? We're going to look into the making of Lucifer who would become Satan, okay? Ezekiel, I'll give you some time. I know Ezekiel is not an easy book to, uh, to go through. That book of Ezekiel is on my list to teach on. I'm still studying it. It's, it's probably, I think the book of Ezekiel is probably the most complicated book in the whole Bible. And when I'm ready, I will teach on it one day. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 15. Okay, let's begin reading. Son of man, take up a lamentation unto the king of Tyrus. Okay, now we're going to get back to who's the king of Tyrus. But who do you think she sounds like to you? And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, speaking of this king, Thou sealest up the sun, up, up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, before we read on, my contention is this is Lucifer, okay? And many believe so, and I'll and we'll talk about that, that in a little more. So look at this through the eyes of that's who this is. And the scriptures really scream it. Look at verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. This is what, now, when Lucifer was made, he was the most beautiful of all angels. The Bible says in the New Testament, Satan comes on as an angel of light. It's kind of interesting. How does Hollywood always portray Satan? <laughs> this, like, lizard creature with, you know, with tail. tail and everything. People, if you saw that coming, you'd run. He doesn't look like that. And I don't think, you know, did he lose that beauty? Well, the New Testament says that he comes on as an angel of light. I think he's very deceptive. He's a father of lies. And if he wants to look beautiful, he can cloak himself like in Star Trek to look beautiful. Because this is what he looked like. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. Boy, you can't. This is an expensive guy here. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second. Some people, 
And this is really the only scripture that alludes to it. So I don't really know, but it's talking about he sung beautifully. He had a beautiful voice. And that some people believe that Lucifer was the first worship leader. So wouldn't it be interesting now, you know how I feel about a lot of worship leaders and, you know, there's no, you know, I don't want to get into it, but uh, could music be used as a tool for evil? Absolutely. Yeah. And who would know better about music than the king of it, the prince of darkness, and it's not Ozzy Osbourne, okay? Uh, could he use it? People, we all know music is a powerful tool. God created music for his glory. God actually loves music. But can it be used to bring people one way or to the other? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. My life growing up, music took me this way. It didn't bring me to God, I can tell you that. So, but that's for another study. V, uh, verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. A cherub is an angel that covereth. And I have set thee so. Who? God. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted the wisdom by thy wisdom by the reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold you, what you really are. Now, some people say, well, how do you know that's really talking about Lucifer? Okay. And you know what? If you want to debate that it's king, of course, there was a king of Tyre and all that stuff. It doesn't fit that this man, this earthly king was in all these places. But even if you don't want to buy that this is Lucifer, it doesn't really matter. But the fact that God creates anyone in perfection, that's the point, okay? And an angel, angels were created in perfection, meaning that we were all created perfect. No sin in us, no sin in Lucifer. Because if that was the case, then God created sin and his creation isn't perfect. Meaning that God isn't perfect and God is imperfect. Meaning God is not really all good. He has a little bit of good in him. Like what the people say, well, everybody has a little bit of good in him. Well, that's not what the Bible says, okay? But what if God just has a little bit of good? What if God has 99.9% .9 goodness, but 1% evil? Well, can you say God is all good? No, you can't. And if that be the case, then God could have some monster in him. He would have to be. But let's look at another scripture, just in case. Okay, and, and just if leave your finger in Ezekiel, because we're going to go back there. Then you're going to get mad at me because you have to go back and find it again and say, Don, why did he do that? So keep your finger in Ezekiel. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 14, because there's no doubt who this is. Okay. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Prophet Isaiah. That's one big book, the book of Isaiah. Okay. Isaiah 14, 12. Everybody there, mostly? I'm gonna, I really want you to read along. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Okay, there it is. Wow, the word Lucifer is really in the Bible. Yeah, it is. Son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? Oh, weakens the nations, huh? Hmm. For thou hast said in thy heart. Now, as we read on, these are called the five I wills of Lucifer, okay? 
Listen to what is in his heart. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. And we're talking about the, the, the throne room, the throne. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to be higher than God. I will sit up also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Do you know what that's what most people want to be? They want to be God or a little God. But let's read further. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms? That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? Hey, that could be an answer to a question. Who's destroying cities? That openeth not the houses of the prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even of them, lie in glory, every one of his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. And as the remnant rain, uh, raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. Which means there's going to be a day when everyone gets to see who he really is. It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. Remember you were scared of the big wizard and then you see the guy behind pulling the strings and he's this little guy, you know, he's not too, he's, hey, you know. One day the world's gonna go, so that was Lucifer? Ruined everything? When you get to see him, the world will be in awe. Now, I don't know if you guys see it, but in these two scriptures that I just read, lay the answer really to just about everything. So let's go back to Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 15. Because this, it's so important that you have to, you, you can't go you know, both ways with this. This is either going to be interpreted one way or the other. Back in Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15. Verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So let's just say this is Lucifer. Okay? Perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God, and then we went through how beautiful, and then at the end of verse 13, uh, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes speaking about how he spoke and how he sung apparently was prepared in the day that thou was created now we stop there for a second what's the first thing we see god made lucifer beautiful he created everything about him to be wondrous and of all the angels that were ever made he was the most beautiful the most powerful, the most perfect. He was perfect. And God made him perfect. I have set thee so. Verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mount of God. Thou walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Complete access to know everything. People, do you know who knows the Bible best? Loose Satan. He knows this because he knows, you know what? He knows God better than we do. Okay? Well, I shouldn't say that because once you come to Christ, okay, you have something that he doesn't. Okay? You have the mind of Christ because Satan can be deceived. He's been deceived, but he's pretty smart, people. You know, if what's a high IQ for a human? What's a number? 140, 160. Well, if that's a high IQ for a human, and let's just say an angel's IQ is like 10,000, well, Satan's IQ is probably like a million. He's smart. He's brilliant. 
He's the, the Bible calls him the master, Jesus calls him the master deceiver. He was a liar from the beginning. There is no truth in him. He is the father of lies. He's the first liar. Everything he does is a lie and filled with deception. How can he do it? Well, how do politicians do it? They're very good at it, right? And they actually make their story sound good. Hey, I'm gonna follow this one. Sounds really good. Where do I sign? And that's what the world has done. But look at verse 15. This is an important one. And we begin to see the answers to all of our questions. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. Till. Till, till what? What happened? Till iniquity. Iniquity is a big King James word for sin. Till sin was found in thee. Well, was it hiding? And God didn't see it? How did this happen? Look at verse 16. And we can begin to see what happened to Lucifer, people, is what happens to us. Same thing. Here is, here is how it happened. By the multitude of thy merchandise, he has everything. Wealth. Power. Okay? They have filled thee, the midst of thee, the center of who you are, with violence because you wanted more people. You know, um, back in the day, uh, there used to be the old famous rich person. Who was the richest person back in the day? It was like Rockefeller. Now people don't know who he is. Now it's Bill Gates or Elon Musk and stuff like that. But back in the day, Rockefeller was the richest man in the world. And it's said that a reporter asked him, well, how much money is enough? And he goes, just one more dollar. Okay, one more dollar. See, you're never satisfied with what you have. You always want more. Uh, Timothy Kel uh, Keller, I think it is, uh, in his book, um, uh, I forgot the name of the book, uh, but he describes why man is never happy. And he actually, he's a Christian pastor from the church in New York City, some, some church there. Timothy Keller. Keller? I forgot the name. Uh, uh, he said he once read an article, and this might be a strange segue. Well, that's a real strange way you're going, Pastor, but we'll get back to this. He read an article about Madonna, the singer, okay? Back in the day, you know, if you know Madonna, she was it when I was growing up in the 80s, you know, like a virgin and all that stuff and all those songs. She was it. Have you seen Madonna lately? Ain't too much flash going on. And they asked her, kind of in the mid of her career, you know, what is, you know, what's your biggest struggle, you know, and the thing is keeping up with myself. And that is, Every day you want, you know, you reach this pinnacle and then what's the fear of losing that place? What if you're not in the news every day? So what would you do? And, and, and she described, it's actually a horrible existence because if I do something, there was a big a story I read about when she came out with that song, Like a Prayer. It was a big uproar because she was, you know, bowing down to, you know, people in heaven and the cross and all perverted stuff. Why did she always take it to the next level, like Lady Gaga? Why? Because she goes, I want to stay relevant. And it's always one day out of my grasp because once I'm out of the news, I fade away. And there's no peace in me because what do I do next? Because they're not talking about me. You'll never be satisfied with that because, and this pastor quoted her, he goes, you know, I'm not saying I like her music or anything, but it's a very profound statement because it explain, explains a lot. And that's basically what Lucifer was, okay? I want to stay relevant. I have everything, but it's not enough. You would think second in, in power next to the creator of the cosmos is a pretty big 
You're not getting much higher than that unless you want to go higher. Okay? By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have thy merchandise have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned, therefore. But thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. And then it goes into further, but is there more? Yeah, look at verse 17. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. People, when you begin to love yourself so much, you know, you become a narcissist. Lucifer was a narcissist. He loved himself and he began to look at what God had made. It's like a world today. We look at God's creation and instead of giving God the glory for it, what do we do? We, oh, yeah, a big explosion happened. Lucifer began to look in the mirror and say, hey, I'm beautiful. I, I think I'm more than God thinks I am. And I don't know if I'm happy in this position. Now, what's interesting, one of the things we'll ask God one day when we get to heaven is how long, we don't know how long Lucifer was reigning with God or a part of his plan with all the angels. Was it millions of years? Was it a week? We don't really know. But that was the first creation. So it doesn't matter how many, you know, how long he spent with God, but something happened. And what's really, again, thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou, who has corrupted Lucifer? Himself. Thou has corrupted thy wisdom. What wisdom? That God gave him. The perfection. By reason of your brightness. Your loving of your beauty has corrupted your mind. You have done this to yourself. And because of it, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may see what you really are one day. But what does this all mean? Well, if Lucifer was created perfect... If the angels were created perfect, if humans were created perfect, if the entire creation was created perfect, well, what happened? Did God make them all sin, being imperfect himself, or do we not understand the word perfect? That's an important thing. And the word perfect in the Hebrew from our scripture is tormin. It means entire, complete truth. Meaning that God made us all with all things to make us perfect. But before we get to that, because we're going to talk about what that is, well, if we were perfect and Lucifer was perfect and we begin to see what really was going on, okay? Because really, we have to decide where this sin is coming from. But before we get to that next week, which really is everything, we need to first conclude, and let's get this off the table here. God is perfect, okay? He has to be. Number one, because something that is broke cannot create that which is whole. That's why man cannot save mankind. Darkness cannot create that which is light. We spoke about that Sunday morning sermon about the darkness and the light. But let's see what the scriptures say. 1 John 1, 5. Then this is the message which we have heard of him and declared unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Zero. But that's just one scripture. I always tell you, if you're going to base a theology 
okay? Or a new, oh, I found something new, I'm gonna follow. You can't do it off of one scripture. You gotta have at least three. In any law cases or criminal cases, if you're gonna prove a point, you need three witnesses, you need more than one. That's why God upped it with four apostles, uh, with four gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He wanted four different people, one up from three that would have been enough, to tell their story of what they saw when they saw Christ from each one of their vantage points. A rich man, a poor man, a fisherman, a tax, all these different people, okay? So let's read another scripture, okay? The book of Daniel. You're gonna to have to search for that one unless you're a good Bible searcher. Daniel chapter nine, verses 14. I'm going to do 14b because I don't want to lead it lead astray. We're going to talk about the rest of that scripture another time, but I want to get this point. In Daniel 9, 9, 14, second part of the scripture, for the Lord our God is righteousness in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. In the book of, in the book of Exodus, let's go there, chapter 15, 11, <coughs> You know, it was fun the other, the other day, we were, uh, my mom staying with me, and I haven't watched it. We brought my mother-in-law out, and we watched the Ten Commandments again. It's like three and a half hours long. I love that movie. I know it's Hollywood, but it's like, it's so cool. It's just a cool movie, and, and we see God up on the mountain and making those commandments. Wow, it was cool. But anyway, in the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verse 11, who is like unto thee, O Lord? And now we see the personal name of God because we see the uppercase L-O-R-D, which is Yahweh God, okay? The I am, when God, because remember, before Moses went up, the people of the, uh, the Jews, they didn't even know God's name. He was the, the, the God with no name. And that's why Moses asked him, but who are you? He goes, I am, okay? I am the self-existing, eternal God. I am Yahweh. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which would become Israel, okay? But in Exodus 15, 11, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Now, you might say, among the gods? What other gods? Lowercase g. Well, there be other gods out there, but not in the sense of, that you think there are spiritual principalities, demonic, okay? And uh, it, it was interesting, you know, in the Ten Commandments, you see the nation of, of what they call Egypt. They had many gods, Ra, and, and we know of Baal, and they were worshiping, and people, what makes people worship like Buddha statues and stuff if they don't do anything? For every statue, and this is a, a warning, every statue of, I believe, anything that's made of a picture of a, of, a, of, a, of a heavenly thing comes with a demonic influence. And how does Satan keep you following this false religion, this cult? He's got to do something. Otherwise, you wouldn't follow, right? So the gods or the God, what does the Bible say? Who is the God of this world? Satan. Satan. Is the God is the power of the air, okay? Lowercase g, okay? The word God, lowercase g o d, is that that governs like a governor. It controls things. It can control certain things. Anything that controls can use that word g o d, lowercase, okay? So there wasn't other gods, but there are spiritual powers. Ephesians six twelve talks about. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness? Wow, you can't get much more holy than that. Glorious in how holy you are. Fearful in praises, doing wonders. Let's go to Isaiah 45, 18. I'm going to go just a little bit over, but not too much. Isaiah 45, 18. And that's why people, it's so important that every word in the word of God is very important. 
And that's why it's very important that we go back and we look at the original translations. We look at the original Hebrew. We look at the original Greek or whatever it may be. Because words that look, that we assume say one thing, like terrible in, in, uh, in our language is a horrible thing. But God is called the terrible God because that word terrible in Old English meant wonderful, powerful, you know, so you have to be careful. But let's look at Isaiah 45, 18. For thus saith the Lord, Yahweh, the great I am, personal, that created the heavens, God himself, that formed the earth and made it, he has established it. And this is such an important scripture on many levels. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. Okay? Inhabited with who? Okay? And that could lead us up to that he formed the earth and the heavens after the angels because the earth was made for humans. So a little bit interesting there. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Wow. It's God speaking himself. But the word vain here means worthless waste or desolation whatever god made was perfect he didn't make humans all deformed with birth defects and cancer and blind and they can't hear and this one has a stutter no that's not how it originally was in matthew 19 16 and behold one came and said unto him coming to Jesus, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus always answers the question with the question. And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? What are you calling me good for? There is none good. Now Jesus isn't saying that he's not good, but he's making a point here for another study. There is none good but one, that is God, which Jesus is. But if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments, but that's not the gospel. Jesus is teaching a story there for another day. Now, we're going to close here for now, and I want you to think upon all the things we said, because, again, if God is perfection, and he is, okay, and I'm, I could say at this point, he's not a monster. There's no way. He's not a monster. He is perfection. And Jesus Christ is perfection personified in the form of a human. And God created everything good in the beginning. How do we know that? In the book of Genesis 1, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way through there. In the beginning, God created light and it was good. He created the earth and it was good. Everything by the sixth day that he created was good. It's perfect. Creation was perfect, and we always say, no ticks, no poison ivy, no, no thorns on rose bushes, no mosquitoes, right? None of that stuff. Lions didn't eat meat. They, a lot of people believe in the beginning there was no meat eating, no blood shed, okay? So everything was a lot different. Well, if everything was good, then how did Lucifer become Satan? Which, in case you don't know, the word Satan, God gave him that word and said, you shall now be called Satan when he fell, which means the adversary, an enemy of God. That's what Satan means, okay? He lost the name Lucifer. He's no longer Lucifer. He's not what he was, okay? He's a perverted form of that with a lot of power, right? It's like a rich person with a lot of power. That's dangerous. They can control a lot of things. So how did Lucifer become Satan? How did man become evil? Because this really is, is the key to it all and what makes God perfect and glorious. And we will see as we go into more scriptures and answer, we're gonna answer all those questions that everyone has, why things are the way they are because it doesn't have to be. Do you, do you know that we were not meant to die physically? We were supposed to live forever. And, and you know, it's, it's been a sad thing. This on a personal note, I have my mother-in-law who's staying with us and she's not really doing well. She's very, she's like 90 something and, and she's really declining quickly. 
And I tell you, I have a hard time watching and watching her because everything is just shriveling up. And, and the skin is like paper, and you can see the bones through. Oh, she looks horrible. And it's a picture of man after the fall. Yeah. It, 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 God says, that's not how it was supposed to be, people. What happened? That we, because people, you know, they look for, gee, I don't want to get old and die. And it's, you know. But what does the Bible say? The inward man plays God in Christ is being renewed day by day. The outward man is perishing. In case you guys don't know that, every day the outward part, and you can feel it in your hips and your knees and your eyes and everything, everything is starting to go. God says, I made you perfect. And if I made you perfect, then we were going to be living on this earth, walking with God, with no sickness, no pain, nothing. Okay? It's very interesting. Okay? So, it really, who, who are we going to blame for this? And why is everything not getting, you know, the law of entropy? Really, people, things are not getting better. Things are decaying. People, things like rust. Don't you hate rust? Yeah. Rust is a part of the fall. It decays. Things that are metal, you take anything, you know, I'm a big Titanic fan. You know what? They say it's breaking my heart in a couple, in a couple of years, the Titanic is going to be completely gone. It's going to cease to be. It's just dissolving into it. It'll be a, a rust stain on the bottom of the ocean, two miles down. Okay? Things are rotting. Things are decaying. God says that's not. You know, a lot of people say, gee, you go to the beach and you look at and you see the creation of God and you see his glory. But you know what you also see? The results of sin. You smell dead fish <laughs> and things rotting. That's a picture of that. I don't like that part. That stinks. Garbage rots. It stinks. Me, me and my wife always laugh. Two, we, we've decided there's two things that are certain in life. God and garbage. Because our garbage pail is always full. Every time I look at it, I said, honey, I just emptied this thing. I must empty it six times a day. We never run out of garbage. <laughs> and garbage is the result of, of, of the fall. It has to be. And God. Garbage is certain. And God is certain, okay? And you have to make sure that you know him because he loves you. And what he went through and is going through to wave flags. Come on, people. Bring it in. The last rap here. Come to me now. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we just love you, Lord. We love your word, Lord. I love it, Father, that you don't leave us just clueless. Father, as, as I was talking to a, a young man the other day and met me in my office, really wonderful young man, but, you know, going to college and, you know, really questioning if, you know, how can God be real and, and all the things that he's been taught in school and how it gets into his mind and everything. And, and how do we, you know, the older question is, how do we know this Bible is true? And, well, God, in your perfection, you would not make a creation without a manual without telling us how to keep the creation going why the creation is here who made the creation you would not just throw us out and say well just go and figure it out for yourselves no you are an organized perfect God and you give us an organized plan and I believe every detail we need to know is in your word uh, and if we search, and that's the great thing, Father, when, when we say, gee, I wonder about this. I don't know. Well, it makes it exciting for us. To, well, let's, let's dig down. Let's we can find anything. What is, does God have? A, and, we, and tonight, Lord, we saw these amazing scriptures in Ezekiel and Isaiah that most people will never see and never read. Like in Genesis chapter 6, uh, incredible scriptures that explains the pyramids and who built those things and all kinds of stuff and all that technology, Lord. It's in there, Lord. It's not a silly book. It's a scientific book. It's a, it's a textbook. It's a holy book. It's a book about who made us and who you are and answers to why things can get so bad sometimes, but also answers to why they can be glorious and what you want from us and that is your love our love because you certainly have proved yours in jesus name 
Amen.